In this short video, we're going to talk about higher order derivatives. So if we think about it, the derivative f prime of x is also a function, so we should be able to take its derivative. Remember, so take the derivative of f prime of x and we get f prime prime of x. We don't usually say f prime prime of x. This is the second derivative of f of x, or we read it as del of x. So that's the second derivative. Notation. And again, even though it's not a fraction, we get consistent of thinking about it as a fraction. So d by dx, if we were to think of this as multiplication, give me d squared, and then dx times dx, give me dx squared. So the second derivative is d squared y by dx squared. Normally we avoid Leibniz notation. It's a bit awkward for higher order derivatives. But we could go ahead and take the derivative of the second derivative and get the third derivative. That would be f triple prime of x. And we're consistent with the Leibniz no notation. Then we would have d cubed y dx cubed. And finally, the, if we wanted to go to a higher order derivative, we run out of primes. We usually don't put an f quadruple prime. Some people do, but really uh, we just start putting the order of the derivative then as a superscript in parentheses. Sometimes we have numerals, other times we have it as Arabic numerals. So this is how we would write the fourth derivative of f of x. So let's look at an example. We'd like to find the first and second derivative of f of x equals x cubed minus 4x. Well, let's start with the first derivative. We're going to go ahead and use the limit definition. So we're going to take f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, and then take the limit as h goes to 0. Now, I cannot just substitute h zero in for h at this point. Uh, but if I do some algebra, so I'll go ahead and expand x plus h cubed. I'll remove the parentheses, collect some like terms. Already I have fewer terms. And then I can see that, oh, in the terms that are left in the numerator, I have a common factor of h. So let's go ahead and factor out that h, which is good because then I have an h in the numerator as a factor and an h in the denominator. And h divided by h will just give me 1. So now after I simplify, I can just replace h with 0 and the expression that's left over is 3x squared minus 4. So we found f prime of x, the first derivative of f of x, equals 3x squared minus 4. Now let's find the second derivative. That would be the derivative of the derivative. So we go back to our limit definition. So now I'll have the limit as h goes to 0 of f prime of x plus h minus f prime of x all over h. Again, I'll have to do some algebra. I'm going to have to expand and collect, remove parentheses, collect like terms. And at this point, I can see, oh, the 3x squared minus 3x squared is going to be 0. And what's left over is just a 6xh plus 3h squared. So they, those two terms have a common factor of h. 
So factor that out. That means I can have h over h, which is 1. Now I can just use direct substitution, and I'm left with 6x. So the second derivative is just 6x. Let's look at another example, and let's see if we can determine, if we're given three graphs, one graph is the function, one graph is f prime of x, and the other graph is f double prime of x. And we'd like to match them up. Which one goes with which function? Well, here's a big hint. We're going to focus on how many times does the graph change from increasing to decreasing? And that would correspond to having a positive uh, slope for the tangent line versus a negative slope for the tangent line. So in A, there's only one change going from decreasing to increasing. In graph B, there are two changes. So we are going from increasing then to decreasing and back to increasing. And in C, there are three changes. I go from decreasing to increasing, back to decreasing, back to increasing. Well, why is that important? That would tell me that every time I go from uh, increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, that means the slope of the tangent line has to pass through zero. So the derivative of one zero. Now none of B nor C has one zero. There are more than two zeros in fact. So none of A, B or C could be the derivative of A. On the other hand, B has two of these change points where it's changing from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So the derivative of function B would have to have two zeros. And two zeros is exactly what we have in A. And so A could be the derivative of B. And I see that C has three points where it changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing, increasing. So the derivative of c would have to have three zeros, and we have three zeros in graph b. So b could be the derivative of c. So there's no derivative for a. Uh, C can't be the derivative of anything. And so that would say that C, graph C represents our function. B could be the derivative of C, so B would be F prime, and A could be the derivative of B, so A would be F double prime. So one final note. When we're talking about a position function, we saw that the first derivative 
position gives us the velocity. The second derivative, which would be the rate of change of the velocity with respect to time, is what we call the acceleration. And the third derivative. Be the second derivative of the velocity or the first derivative of the acceleration, and sometimes called j of t. A jerk measures the change in acceleration, so there is that kind of jerk. So we'll look at these. Uh, the, uh, physical meanings of higher order derivatives in more detail in a future section. But I hope you've enjoyed this short video on higher order derivatives.